Hi, I'm Dermot Early, and I'm going to show you how I would have solved some of the problems from the Financial Modeling World Cup Battle of 16 a couple of months back. It's probably a long shot that you're watching that video if you don't already know what it is, but just in case, the Battle of 16 was a knockout battle between 16 financial modelers to solve various different uh, sort of problem solving cases using Excel. Uh, so for example, some of the ones I'm going to be looking at today is, you know, this one with dice game, this one with chess, this one with bingo, this one with Tetris rules. There were others with poker, rock, paper, scissors, all kinds of things. Um, so I'm going to be looking at four problems today, which are the four round one problems from the Asia Pacific round. Uh, and I'm going to tackle them in my subjective order of increasing difficulty. So I'm going to start with the dice game. And for all of these, I'm going to try to do it at a reasonable speed, but you know, I'm not trying to do a speed run. I'll try to sort of explain what I'm doing. Um, and yeah, let's just dive right in. <clears throat> so the first one, it's a board game, some instructions here. So you're playing a board game, start off at zero, you roll a dice and you move yourself that many tiles forward. Uh, so if you roll a five first, you move to cell five. There's 30 cells on the board. If you end up on the 30th cell, you stop. Otherwise, if you roll a move that would take you past it, then instead you move that number of steps backwards. So if you're on 25 and you roll a six, that would take you to 31, but there is no 31, so you go backwards to number 19. Uh, game lasts for a max of 10 moves, and you uh, you've been given all the dice throws and you have to figure out where will the chip end up after the 10 moves. So a couple of quick comments on the shape of the data and then we'll kind of dive in. So obviously the first thing you'll notice is, you know, you haven't been given numbers, you've been given these sort of interesting dice pictograms. <clears throat> and one of the things that came up in a lot of the problems uh, in this tournament was the challenge of having sort of odd shaped input. So in this case, you know, it's not 10 consecutive cells with numbers in them, it's 10 consecutive three by three regions with some number of dots in them in the shape of a dice, uh, which you know, looks cool, but is can be tricky to work with. So I, I suppose I should have mentioned up front all the problems I'm gonna look at today, the uh, competitors had 10 minutes to solve on the day. So there's a temptation with something like this when you know the data is in a messy format to do something to clean it up first. Um, but when time is tight, if you can, you know my suggestion is just work with it as it is and uh, and see what you can do. So, having said all that, let me quickly show you how I would have done this one. I'm just gonna take this, put it over here, over there, and let's do. So I'm gonna just put in a move zero. So I'm gonna say obviously everything starts off at zero. And then I'm just going to, in, in each three by three area where I know that there's a dice, I'm gonna put in one formula. So there's gonna be one formula here, one formula here, one formula here, one formula here, and so on across. Um, now you can break this down into multiple steps if you want. You can start with you know one formula to count the number in the dice, and then another formula to figure out how far you've gotten so far, and so on. But it's not that hard to just do it all in one go. So here's what that's going to look like. So again, you always start out at zero, but just treat that as any prior move. Uh, oh, I hit my formula bar. That's not very good. Let's I can quickly get that back. That's kind of important. Okay, so we'll say equals if this is 30, then we'll stay at 30. Otherwise, if this plus, and now how are we going to count the dice? Oops, I'm going to do a count if, over here, I'm going to count how many of these nine cells are, I want just this dot, and then select one cell, press F9, and you'll see it just gives you that character, which is the sort of bullet character. So if that plus the number of dots you roll, which is the number, the number on the dice, uh, is greater than 30, then we am take the previous move minus the dice roll. Oops. And if it's not more than 30, then we're going to take the previous move plus the dice roll. Uh, that's it. That's it. 
So then we just copy that across. Uh, add a little further, copy that with no collision pattern, but there we go, one more time. And then hopefully we can just take this and copy it down. The important thing to note, just like as I was copying it across, uh, I skip every second row. So here, sorry, I skip every skip two out of every three columns. So here I'm going to skip the relevant rows. So I just need to see exactly how far down. Let's see, the last row is 162. Okay, so I've got to get down to 162. And paste. And now I've got this weird sort of grid, but hopefully they're all in the right place. And then each of the outputs, we just have to pick up where it is at the end of the last turn. And take that to the top. And there we go. So. Did, uh, I did check earlier that my total should be that magic number 1379. So that means I got it right. Cool. So that's that one. Let's, yeah, let's just keep going. Next problem. So this one is called Chess with No Stress. And this one you've got a little kid watching his father and his grandfather playing chess. He doesn't know the rules, so he's just trying to record what's happened with the board. So he notes down the starting cell of each piece and the direction it moves and the number of cells it moves. And he has a table where he recorded all this and he wants to figure out where each of the chess pieces ended up. So if you're not familiar, the layout of the chess board is kind of placed here. So it's you know, letters across the top, numbers down the side, just like an Excel board, except the numbers are just like an Excel grid, except the numbers are run up the side here. <coughs> so, Let's take, can give us an example, or if not, we can do an example quickly. Yeah, no example. Alright, so let's say here, for example, the pawn starts at p7. So that starts off here, move two steps down, and one step, one step, one step, and one step. So it should end up in the uh, Okay. So now. Another kind of good general point that comes up here, which is you might be tempted to say, all right, let me first think about something that will deal with ups and downs, and then I'll think about something that will deal with lefts and rights, and all these diagonals are going to be complicated, and so on. On a problem like this, you'll save, if you have the time to do the whole thing, you'll save yourself a lot of time by coming up with a general solution. Uh, and what do I mean by a general solution? Well, first of all, rather than thinking about you know, 10 different moves as there are laid out across here, well, there's only eight different directions you can go in, so I would start off, and then you don't need to know like, what steps you went to along the way, you just need to know where you ended up. And so the first thing I'm going to do is just work out how many steps in total were taken in each of the eight directions. And kindly enough, there's this list of arrows used here. I'm going to take this, and I'm just going to throw some cells here so I can actually see. Let's see a bit from there, and I'm going to that's better. Okay, <clears throat> so now let me paste the arrows. And then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say sum if. So just a quick reminder all of these are a number followed by a single arrow. So I'm just going to say sum if. Right. So if the right hand piece of this, I'm going to lock the columns in here, so it's just always from F to O, and I'm going to pop it across. If the right hand one of that is equal to this arrow up here, then uh, one times, one times, because when I use the left to get the number out of the text, it's going to treat it as text. Some will ignore text, but if I do one times, it'll force it to treat it as a number. So the left of that, and again, I'll lock in the columns. One, otherwise, zero. So we'll sum that up. So you'll see we get a total of six down moves. I'll just double check quickly. Two, three, four, five, six. So that's good. And then carry that over across. So we get nothing in the other direction, but now it's 
copy this down because I don't think you remember this. So here we've got you know, one down move, one left move, and two diagonal down moves, and so on. So the next thing I'm going to do is, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is move these my things and move up a couple more columns here, and a couple more rows, I should say, at the top. So the next thing I'm going to do is just categorize each of these in terms of how many steps, uh, let's say, left, right, uh, and actually right, it makes sense for right to be positive and left to be negative, and how many steps, let's say, up is positive and down is negative because we've got the numbers running from the bottom to the top. So, let's see, this is a down, so that's negative, up is positive, across, there's nothing up or down, that's and down is negative, up is positive, up is positive, down is negative. And then I do the same thing for right, left, so this has no right or left, left is negative, so that's minus one, right is positive, up is negative, right is positive, left is negative, right is positive. And so once I've done that, all I need to do is multiply the number of moves in each of each type by the number of spaces up or down or left or right it takes me, and that'll tell me uh, the total number of moves up, down, and left, right that I've got. So first I'll do my up, down, and then I'll do my right, left. So this is just going to be some product. These times those. And the answer is I get a total of minus six, so I've moved down six spaces. Uh, and a quick sense check is, you know, the smallest of these is minus seven, and the biggest is plus seven. And that makes sense, because that's the most number of steps you can go in any direction without falling off the chessboard. So that's good, and we should get the same min and max, or no bigger and no smaller, when we do right and left. So let's do that. So that's just going to be this. That's the rights and the lefts, and again, yes, the lowest is minus 5, and the biggest is 7. So we've got that, and then the last thing we need to do uh, is figure out how to get from the starting cell to the end of the cell. And the way we can do that is uh, with a little help from code and car. So code and car are uh, functions that switch between ASCII codes that represent characters and the characters themselves. So for example, a, the code of A is 65, and the car of 65 is A. So that's going to let us, uh, and then you know, the handy thing is they're in order, so code of B is 66, and the car of 66 is B. So I can go straight to my ending cell now, and I'm going to do it right here. So it's going to be, uh, I'm going to take the car of code of left. So I'm going to take the first character of this, left that one, I'm going to take the code of that, I'm going to add to that or subtract from that, but it's already signed the right way, the number of right and left moves, and then I'm going to turn that back into a character, and then I'm going to combine that, text combine, with that, plus, uh, I'll put it in brackets, right of this, comma one, so that's the number of uh, plus, the number of up down spaces. And I think that's it. That's my formula. And that one ends up in B1, which is where we wanted it to. And then we can then just copy that down. And this. There we go. So the nice thing about this approach is, you know. There's nothing that's particularly sensitive about the number of moves. There's nothing that's particularly sensitive about, you know, what's the most steps you take in any direction. So I've always been taking five steps here, six steps there. It's no problem. There's no real distinction between pawns and queens and anything else. You've just got, like, a pretty flexible general solution. Uh, I think that's kind of all I have to say about that one. Uh, okay, so that's that one. <coughs> Next one, bingo. So the instructions here, two players are playing uh, 50 rounds of bingo European style. They're using the same bingo tickets for each game. Why is this not playing it? Select. Select. 
Never. So, playing 50 rounds of bingo, they're using the same bingo tickets for each game, but the sequence of numbers drawn is different every time. So down below here, we have the sequence of numbers drawn. So for game one, first they draw 54, then 67, then 80, 79, 57, 84, etc. Uh, all the way through to 90, 90 different numbers in place. So they all get drawn one at a time. Uh, and you have to <coughs> help the players score each round of the game and show which number was drawn when a player won one line, two lines, or the whole game. So, quick explanation, you know, let's say your player won, uh, and, I don't know, first there's a 44 drawn, and then a 31, and then a 14, and then a 5, and then a 66, and then an 87, and then a 42. At that point, when a 42 is drawn, you've got one complete line. So each, each horizontal is a complete line. Um, and then whatever it carries on, a 36, a 25, an 8, a 17, a 57, and at that point you've got two complete lines, and then 71 and a 90, and at that point you've got three complete lines. And so what we're interested in is what is what is the number drawn that first completes one line on either of these tickets, then what's the number drawn that first completes two lines on either of these tickets, and then what's the number drawn that first completes the entirety of one of these tickets. Um, and again, this one, there's lots of like funky data formatting. So here, you know, these are two by two regions that have been merged together. That's kind of awkward. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, these ones, likewise, are two by two regions. And also just the layout of the ticket. There's not a number in every place and so on. So, you know, it's a bit messy. But <coughs> uh, again, as I'll, I'll kind of show you in a lot of cases, in the real world, you sort of start a lot of this kind of thing by saying, okay, let's clean up the data first and then go from there. But, you know, when you've got 10 minutes, you can get pretty creative about how much you want to live with. Um, one of the just general good trick for this kind of uh, starting setup uh, is just hide most of the data in between because it's very wide uh, and it doesn't really help you much. So uh, let's just talk very quickly about the logic and now I'll kind of turn that into a formula. So for each of the five numbers here, I want to figure out where that occurs along here. I'm going to use a match to do that. Now, the match won't tell me in what round it occurs because, you know, if it matches in the first one, I'll get a match of one, but if it matches in the second one, I'll get a match of three because there's an empty cell here, and then I'll get a match of five, and so on. But for now, I'm just going to ignore that because I just need to think about which number is biggest, so which one happens latest. So I'm interested in what's the last number for a given line that gets uh, that gets pulled. So what I'm going to do is match all these numbers against that. Um, again, I could clean up to just pull out the five numbers first, but instead what I'm going to do is just match the whole strip against it and then just do an if error to ignore these cases. I'm interested in the max, so I'll just say if error is zero, and then that won't contribute to the max. So let's just say player one, line one, What's that going to look like? I'm going to say I'm interested in max uh, of if error match. And then I'm going to go up here. I take these. Now, one quick thing uh, when you're highlighting these, it automatically selects two rows, but uh, this is going to work a lot better if we just have one row. So I'm going to change it to that. So match those against, and I'll come down here and the same thing. Uh, I'll select all of that, but then I'll also change that to a 2, uh, so that I'm just matching this one row, and then I'll also uh, lock in the columns there, because I'm going to copy this across at some point. Uh, I'll lock in the columns in this one as well. Uh, match that 0, if it's narrow, 0, uh, and then give me a max. I think that's all I need to do. So this says the, you know, the 127th column of this section is where uh, the last match of these five numbers comes up, so that's good. Uh, and then I'm going to want when does player two complete the second line, and by the way here when I say first line, second line, I just mean the first in the order they appear on the card. The first one to be completed I'll have to figure out separately in a second, so copy that across, and that, yeah, because I locked the columns that formula doesn't change at all, and I just need to if there were more rows or columns, I would be a little bit more clever about, you know, maybe uh, generalizing this formula further so I don't have to, uh, you know, copy and tweak, but 
when there's just three rows per player, it's probably faster to just copy and tweak. So that's that. And then, so when does player one first line, player one second line, player one third line. So the first one is just the min of these three. The second is median. Or again, you could do large uh, one, two, and three, or small one, two, and three, and the max. And then we want to do all the same thing for the second player. So we'll just p1 equals p1 equals with p2. Uh, and then here, let's just double check the row. The first one is 22, and then I'll go down in twos. So this will be 22. So then 24, 24, and 26, 26. Okay, so and then in, in max up to the right cells. So now the question asks you to get the number that is drawn that results in the outcome. So obviously there's 90 numbers drawn, these numbers are all bigger than that, and that's because Again, it's like 2n plus 1. But because of what I'm looking for is not, I'm not looking for like it was in round 9, I'm looking for it was the 35 in round 9. So that's fine because basically the, the errors will kind of cancel each other out when I come back to this. So uh, let's go here. Excel is having a fight with my quarter. All right, so I'm going to say index this range here. Again, I'm going to lock in the columns. I'm going to change the 33 to a 32, so I'm just looking in one row. And then I'm going to say I want to know a number that corresponds to the smaller of the two first lines. So it's going to be the smaller of this 101 and this. 131. Uh, sorry, no, not that one. And this one. Probably. So it's first completed line for player one, first completed line for player two. Obviously, my labeling here L1, L2, L3, and first, second, third is super confusing, but whatever. 10 minutes to solve the problem. I'm in a rush. Uh, so that's 14. Cool. And then uh, let's see. Can I actually just copy it straight across? I think I can. Yes. So then that'll look at the second and the second, and that'll look at the third and the third. So quick sense check, 14, 42, and 36, it all better be on these cards. 14, 42, 36, there they are. That's good. Uh, anyway, I could do more checks, but I'm not going to do that right now because, uh, well, I think I've got this right. I've looked at these a couple of times before. So, and even if I've got it wrong on the details of the implementation, you kind of get the idea. So then I just copy down, come over here, and then out to the end, paste. Whoops, spill errors, that's not great. Uh, hmm, what did I do wrong there? That's interesting. Let's just do it once and see if it makes that better. Oh yeah, it's probably something I haven't locked. All right, let's check. This one is spilling. Why is that? No, because that's a zero. Why is that? It is because I failed to lock the rows. Okay, sorry. So of course, because I'm going to be copying this down, all of these row numbers have to be locked. Uh, so just to be clear, the, the blue thing here, not the orange thing here. So the blue thing is the um, the range of the bingo card here. So that I want to stay the same as I copy it down the, the 50 or whatever rows, but this orange thing which refers to the row which is the game that I want to change every time I copy it down. So no row lock here, but I do row lock there. So all right, let's quickly patch that up. One, two, three, and then the same thing over here. Dollar twenty two, dollar twenty two, dollar twenty four, dollar twenty four. All right, so let's try that again. 
that looks a little more promising. And then yeah, let's just go back to speedy mode. Oops. <clears throat> uh, incidentally, a small <clears throat> but important thing if you're copying and pasting in weird areas like this where you know it's two cells or you know multiples of four cells or seven cells or whatever, which is if you copy an area uh, that's you know more than one row and then you paste it over another area that's more than one row but a different number of rows, if the area you paste it over is if the number of rows in the area you pasted over is a multiple of the number of rows you originally selected, you'll get whatever, let's say you've selected 10 times as many rows, you'll get 10 copies. But if you uh, paste it over an area that has 10 times as many rows plus one, you'll just get one copy at the top because Excel doesn't understand what you want to do. So in a problem like this where you're trying to copy you know, an odd thing with merged cells down to whatever it is, 50 or some odd number of copies, then it's important to like select the exact area that you want. You can't just, you know, select a thousand cells down and, and copy it into there. Um, so that's, I think, everything about that. Um, yeah, okay, so on to the last problem. And that is, uh, back up earlier. that is Tetris, which is, I think, the most complicated one. Um, and no, no coincidence, this is also one that was set by Dan Mayo, who is known for his uh, challenging problems. So let's see. Oh, no, it's misbehaving again. Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, context is you're playing a game of Tetris, classic NES version, uh, but your game is partly damaged, doesn't provide the score for each game. So basically, uh, what you get is the sequence of move clears. So, you know, you started off at level zero, then you cleared four rows, then you cleared one row, two rows, four rows, two rows, two rows, and then we're given the scoring rules and you need to figure out what score you got in total for the game. So let's take a look at the examples. So here's how the point scoring works. Depending on the level you're on, zero, one, two, three, up to N, and on the number of lines that you clear in a go, this tells you how many points. So if you clear one line at level zero, you get 40 points. At level one, you get 80. And in general, at level n, you get 40 times n plus one. If you clear two lines, you get 100 times n plus one. Three lines, you get 300 times n plus one. Four lines, you get 1,200 times n plus one. Um, so here's a couple of examples. Uh, an example starting at level zero. So you, you clear four, two, 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 two. So you get 1,200 for the first four. That's here, four at level zero. Uh, and 100, 100 for 2, 2. So you clear two twos at level zero. And then the next uh, the next two that you clear takes you up to level one. So that gets you 200. Uh, and then the next two gets you 200 as well. And then this one at level three start, change from level three to level four at 40 lines. So you clear, uh, you clear, I guess this is 10 fours. So the first nine of them get you 4,800 apiece and then the 10th one gets you 6,000. So a little more explanation over here about a game can begin on any level from 0 through 9. The maximum level reached uh, in this will be level 28. Uh, level is reached as soon as the total lines cleared is at least 10 times that level number. So that's over here, for example, where we said, you know, 4, 2, and 2, that's the black ones, are all, uh, that's, you know, 4 and 2 and 2 is 8, so that's all at level 0, but then when you get another 2, that's 10, that trips you over into the next level. Uh, and, ba -ba 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 -bum. Okay, here it is, this is the important thing, the points for line clear are based on the game level after the line clear. Um, and then if the game starts on a level other than 0, uh, where are we? Game starting at a level other than zero will remain at that level until you catch up to that. So if you start at level five, you'll stay at level five until 60 lines are cleared, and then you'll go to six, seven, eight, and so on up. Um, ba -ba -ba I think that's everything you need to know about that. So let's take a quick look at the data. It's just a really long list. Uh, hopefully, you know, someday Excel will have an in-grid split function like they have in uh, Power Query uh, that you can dynamically do rather than just text to columning. Um, but let's come up with a, a semi-neat way to deal with that for now. And then there's a bonus question at the end, which if I'm feeling energetic when we get to that, I will give that one a go as well. 
So let's uh, let's do this. Let's. How many games have we got? We've got thirty. So when I first did this, I took this whole um, took this whole list, split it text to columns, and ended up with you know something that was thirty by whatever a hundred columns. And then you know I had a hundred columns for the number of clears, another hundred columns for what level I was on, and then another hundred columns for the score. So you know solved it all in in one big table, but it was it was quite a mess. So I'm going to try something a little different for this one. I'm going to uh, just solve one example in a kind of neater laid out in a row, and then uh, use a table to get all the other answers. So uh, I'm going to have a game selector here, uh, and then. I'm going to have a uh, round. Um, I don't even need a round. So I'll just have then the clears. And that is going to be. So I'm going <coughs> to. First, I'm going to say index this and give me that one. So then I can just you know, change to two, change to three. So then if I basically build something that solves on this, I can build a data table on this to get the answer for all of them. Uh, but then what I want to do is uh, mid. So what I want to do is basically take the first, third, fifth, seventh, etc. characters from this, um, which are the numbers, and then lay them out in a row. And the way I can do that is by saying mid of that. And then basically what I want to have here is one, three, five, seven, etc. Uh, and then one. So in other words, you know, take the character starting at position one, just one character, then at position three, one character. And the way that I can do this bit in the middle is to say uh, sequence. Uh, so the number of rows is going to be, uh, so I'm going to take this, which is my list of moves, is going to be the length of that. Uh, so the length of that is the number of uh, numbers plus the number of commas, which is one less than the number of numbers. So to get back the number of numbers, I'm going to add one and then divide by two. Uh, so if I got my brackets right, index, uh, no, I haven't, plus one over two. Uh, so, so index goes from here to there. Yes, that gives me my string of moves. Then the length of that goes to, uh, sorry. Okay, so the length closes there, and then put a bracket around that, plus one divided by two. So sequence that, and then comma one. I think that'll do it. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, so I want uh, not quite that, but you're getting pretty close. Uh, so I'm going to go in steps of two. I think that'll get what I need. So that gets me 88 steps. Now if I just quickly check the length of game three, that's 175. Is that plus one, is that over two? That's my 88, good. And just, again, a quick visual check. Four, two, four, 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 two, four, 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 two. Oh man, that's a hard one to visually read, so let's try game number one. Four, one, two, four, two, two, four, 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 four. okay. Four one two four two two four four four. Okay, good. So I think that's working. So now I've got my clears. Then I'm going to get my level. Uh, so that is going to be the max of either the level it started on, because it's if it starts at a level above zero, then it stays there until you catch up. So the max of index that and that, or uh, so sum of all the clears so far, including the current level. So I'll put a dollar on that 29, so that as I go down, this will anchor there and sum the whole column. Uh, so sum of that divided by 10, and then I think I'm just going to want an int of that, but I'll double check that that's not off by one or something weird in a minute. Uh, so you're on level zero. So let's see, you've cleared. Uh, Currently, tell this is my usual. Oh, sorry, yeah, that's because I haven't done one time, so these are not numbers. Now they're numbers. Okay, better. So 5, 7, 11. So hopefully, here I'll get to level 1. And then let's see, I want to get one where it lands exactly on a multiple of 10 if I can. 
Oh, there we go, 50. Okay, so yes, good. So it takes over level 5. That's good. Uh, so, oh yeah, so let me just check how long is the max. Uh, sorry, so then of that plus 1 divided by 2. So I'm just figuring out what's the longest sequence I'll have. There's probably a way I could make this uh, column dynamics to size with the other one, but in the uh, I'm trying to at least somewhat simulate the time pressure, so I haven't figured that out immediately, so I'm just not going to do it. So the max of those is 94, so I'll copy this down to 94 cells. And with that, uh, count 87, go a few more. Uh, so that's 95. Okay, good. So that works. And then I'm going to want a score, and the score is going to be. So I just have uh, a multiplier, which is just, it's always n plus 1, where the n is the number of the level, times either 40, 100, 300, or 1200. So what's that formula going to look like? It's going to look like this, equals uh, level plus 1 times index, whoops, times index. So I'm going to choose from my four, oh, here they are, my four, base level. So you see here, it's the multiplier at the end is always just the one on line one because it's being multiplied by zero plus one, which is one. So it stays the same. So index of that, comma, and which one I'm going to take is that one. So whatever number of clears, I find the multiplier, multiply by the level, and we are away. And let me just check. I probably need to put in an if error to catch the... Oops. Ah, yes, of course. If I index it on zero, then it's giving me the whole row. Uh, so I have to be a little careful. So let's add an if uh, this is greater than zero, then give me all that stuff. Otherwise, give me a zero. And now, hopefully, that'll work. And 761180, I quickly checked that earlier. That's what I'm supposed to get. Good. So now I'm just going to say equals sequence. 30. I'm going to say equal sum. So I'm going to see what the total score is. I want to uh, table that data table. Column input cell is going to be the game number. Oh, that's already calculated. Super speedy. Okay. And then I just need to pop that back in over here. So come over here. Oh, okay. So that's that. And I checked the total as well, 720, yes, good, okay, so that worked. So then very quickly, let's talk about the bonus question. Um, I don't know if I have the best way to do this, but I thought of a way to do this. So assuming that a game starts at level nine and the total lines for the game is 289, what is the minimum number of four line clears in this game that would give a score of at least a million points? So let's unpack that a little bit. So you clear 289 rows in total. You start at level nine. So you're going to end up with some number of points. Um, then obviously you can see from the scoring system that it tilts very heavily in favor of, you know, if you clear the same number of lines in total, if you do it in ones, versus twos, versus threes, versus fours, you score much more highly if you do it in fours. So the question is, how many, what's the least number of fours you can get that'll get you to a million? Uh, so obviously you wanna get the fours as late as you can. So, you know, your last four will be the one that takes you from 285 clears to 289 clears. Um, and then getting, getting yourself up to there, you wanna score as many points as you can without using a four, which is basically gonna mean we're using as many threes as we can. So the way I thought about this is, uh, let's have two tables, one of which is how many points do you score with the fours at the end? So let's just do whatever, 70 rows. So in other words, with one four at the end, two fours, three fours, four fours. Uh, so then this is uh, where it gets you to. So clears at end is gonna be 289 for the last one. And then it's gonna be that minus four for each previous one. Uh, we'll just freeze pain so we can see it all. Um, so then the, uh, the level 
obviously will be uh, this is going to be max of nine and int this over ten. Copy that down, and so the score for that particular row will be twelve hundred for four times level plus one. Uh, so then the cumulative score. So this is what I'm looking to get at. Uh, equals, uh, actually, I prefer to have one formula all the way down. So if you do sum rather than uh, rather than equals that plus that, then you can use it in the top row as well because sum ignores text. Uh, so you can do that. So then I copy that down. So oops, sorry, I've done the wrong one. Uh, back to that. Some about that. Copy it down. So this is telling me if I score one four at the end of 289 levels, it'll get me 34,800 points. If I score ten fours at the end, it'll get me uh, 331,200 points. Um, and whoops. Uh, I'm going to format this nicely, at least semi nicely. So I'm going to work my way down this table, figure out, okay, so if I came down to 17 fours, that would get me 500,000. So if I did 38 fours at the end, that would get me a million points all by itself. But obviously, I'm going to do some number of threes at the start. So now I'm going to do that. So I'm going to say equals sequence. So let's see the most threes that I could possibly need. Uh, if I do fours all the way to 140, then all the way from 140, then I get a million straight away. So I definitely, definitely won't need more than let's say 53. So let's do sequence 50, and then uh, clears at end. So I, you know, I do a three at the start that gets me three, and then each subsequent one gets me that plus three. So you know, if I do let's say 12 threes at the start, then I've cleared 36. Then I want the level. Uh, and that's again the same as over here. We start off at level nine, and then whenever we catch up, it'll overtake that. So whenever I've gotten more than ninety clears, or sorry, more than a hundred clears, the level starts ticking up. Uh, and then score, and this base score for three is three hundred. So it's going to be three hundred times this plus one, and then the cumulative score, uh, which is um, that and. Yes. Oops. And again, we'll do that. And so now the question is, let's say if I come down, if I get, uh, you know, if I do the last nine, uh, if I do the last thirty-six by clearing nine sets of four, that'll score me three hundred thousand points. Will I have scored enough points by then in the threes to make me to a million? So how am I going to figure that out? Well, uh, I'm going to look at the, uh, let's say, clears available for, uh, before, fours. And so that's going to be this minus four. Uh, and then I'm going to look at the uh, max score before. And that's going to be I'm going to look up. Uh, sorry, I'm, I don't know if my logic was right on the most of these I can need. Let's just do it to 100, so that we can be sure that we have the whole lookup table there. And then I'm going to say equals vlookup 285, and I'm going to do a non-exact lookup. So the highest number that I can get above here is the, the points I can be sure of scoring. So we'll four, no zero. That's that. And then we'll add total score equals the score from the fours plus the score from the threes. So in other words, if I score as close to 285 as I can get without going above that with threes, I'll get 469,200. And then if I finish off from there with fours, I'll get 34,800 for a total of 504,000. And then if I copy this down, it'll take me a little while, but copy that down until the first point where it crosses a million. And so the answer is that you need at least 27 fours. So you can, uh, if you, clear the first 181 rows without any fours, you can score 217,800 doing that. And if you clear the rest, 
uh, with 27 fours, you can get 783,600 for that, and that gets you just over a million. Um, and so the answer is, is 27. So I'll pop that in there. So that is that. Uh, I haven't been keeping track of how long I took, but uh, in theory, each of those problems was a, a 10 minute case. Um, I think in practice, uh, obviously I spent a bit of time ch chatting about ideas, but I think in practice, the first one probably took, you know, less than five minutes of actual modeling. This Tetris one, if you include the bonus one, I'm sure I went over the 10 minutes, uh, but I probably got the, the non-bonus piece done within the 10 minutes. Um, so a couple of uh, kind of closing thoughts. Um, number one, uh, you know, me kind of doing these quickly now is not uh, definitely not meant to suggest, you know, I'm, I'm the best and I'm the greatest and whatever. It's uh, part of what I want to show you here is, is actually how important the design and the pre-thought is. In other words, because I have looked at these before and thought about them before, I can very quickly execute the idea. You know, I know how I'm going to design, uh, let's say, for example, this, uh, this chess one. I know that I'm going to first figure out how many of each arrow, uh, and then I'm going to figure out a total up, down, left, right by tagging them like this, and then I'm going to use my codes and cars and whatever to, to convert them. Um, and so once you have that design clear in your head, it's relatively quick to execute it. Um, but, you know, I, my sense is what makes the difference between somebody who is, who is very good and not very good uh, at, you know, performing well under pressure in a competition like this where you have 10 minutes to solve a problem like this is how quickly can you come up with that design rather than what you might expect, which is, you know, how quickly can you mash the keyboard furiously? I think if you spend 30 seconds and very quickly arrive at a smart design, you will do much better even if you're a pretty slow you know slow on the keyboard compared to someone who you know bashes furiously away but an inefficient design and instead of having you know whatever most of these solutions have you know a handful of unique formulas uh, that are copied down you know across every single thing if you go about let's say in this chess one, if you go about solving the down arrows, then solving the up arrows, then solving the left arrows, then solving the right arrows, your solution is going to be much, 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 much more complicated. And so it'll take you longer to execute. Um, so that's that. Um, if you found all this interesting, a couple of uh, things. One is I may do more of these videos uh, if there's interest. Uh, so, you know, if you found this interesting and informative, let me know. Um, you know, the, this was the, the four round one problems from the APAC round, but there's also another four round one problems from the US round, and there's also a bunch of knockout problems, um, which were, you know, these were 10 minute problems. There were kind of 20, 30, 40 minute problems as it went through the kind of quarterfinal, semifinals, final. So there's, there's some more involved problems there. Um, second thing is uh, you should check out the uh, website of uh, the, the organizers, the Financial Modeling World Cup. Uh, let me see, here we are, that's them, the Financial Modeling World Cup. Um, and check out their YouTube channel because you can watch, the whole idea of this Battle of 16 was that it was live streamed. Uh, so you can see me and 15 other people sweating under the pressure <laughs> as we try to, you know, solve these problems with a few thousand people watching. Um, and last thing is if you found all that interesting, uh, then you should probably uh, consider having a go yourself because there's another kind of bigger, better version of this tournament coming up uh, imminently. Um, first round uh, is just in a few days, November 13th. Um, it's called the FMWC Open. Um, and rather than a battle of 16, it's going to be a battle of 128. Uh, and rather than a battle for bragging rights, it's going to be a battle for a $10,000 prize fund. So uh, yeah, a lot to be excited about there. Um, if you want to enter, you probably need to get on it pretty quickly. Uh, and you can go to the FM World Cup website uh, and register there. And I think that that's all I've got for today. Thanks for watching.